Welcome back to the gamery. Today we're playing Detective. More specifically, we're playing a free demo case called Suburbia. So you can download all the files online. We'll leave the link in the description if you want to go check it out. Otherwise, here we go. So here's our website. You have to create an account and you have to use the website throughout the game to look up things. You'll see as we go. But first, we're more interested in this introduction. So they have it on the site or you can also download the file. So here we go. Suburbia. One of the walls of the spacious conference room is taken up by a big screen. It displays images from a similar room located nearly 500 miles away, creating the impression of looking into a huge mirror. At the end of the table, you can see the figure of a grizzled and wrinkled man sitting in a wheelchair. He has been discussing current affairs with the heads of individual departments for 15 minutes until at last he turns to you. Finally, I welcome the branch in Cleveland, which has recently started to represent the agency's interest in the Midwest. I won't take any more of your time. I give the floor to Director Roland, he adds with a smile. Thank you, Director Delaware, says the beaming Olivia Roland, your immediate supervisor. Yesterday evening, the local police station received a call reporting the death of a young woman. The person reporting the finding, John Smitty, claimed that he found the woman's body in the house on 602 Donview Street. The door was wide open, so he looked inside and then called 911. Our colleagues from the police went to the scene and confirmed what the witness reported. They secured the area, and the forensic scientists have been working there since this morning. According to the preliminary information, the victim was shot with a gun. It also came to our attention that a couple of years back, this address was linked to another case, a fire that caused the death of a married couple and the sudden disappearance of their daughter. The case was highly publicized for a while, but then suddenly all grew quiet and died out. That's why Antris was asked to help with this case. Maybe the murder is somehow linked to the fire and the disappearance of the girl. Investigating team, please deliver a report in two days. So we have our game board here. Usually it would be a physical board if you bought the actual game, but for this demo, it's all digital. So before you start, you actually have to choose your characters or investigators. Since we're two players, we choose two. And then of the remaining three, we get the skills of the consultants. So we chose Jack Coleman and Ben Harris, and you can use their abilities once per day. So for the token pool, you just get all the tokens from your investigators and consultants so i already summed them up here okay so if we go back to the intro preparing the case move the timer marker to 9 a.m and add three authority tokens to the token pool time to 9 a.m three authority tokens so if you haven't noticed we did a lot of editing if you download the files for yourself it doesn't quite look like this so what else at three authority tokens, find out who murdered the woman. Discover the motive. The investigation team has three full days to solve the case and prepare the preliminary report. You'll see as we play, as we do things, our time will go and we only have three days. And then at the end of three days, or there's some other conditions too where we might have to create the final report. So the final report, you go to a website and they ask you a bunch of like multiple choice questions. And depending on how you answer them, they'll determine whether you solve the case or not. Okay, and then the stress limit is three so for stress on this time track here if you do things and it kind of takes you over time into the red for every hour you'll get a stress token and if you get the max stress tokens then that's it you have to go and make your final report so it doesn't matter if you're not even at day three yet if you get the max stress tokens that's it you have to go and make your final report so hopefully you don't stress out <laughs> And it's really tricky too because you'll see as we play, you have to decide if you want to do something and you don't know how long it'll take. So you kind of have to make that decision and whatever happens, you might have to work overtime. You can't just say, oops, and then go back and say, I don't want to do that. Okay, so next is our further leads here. So we have some options here. We can interrogate John Smitty, who was the one who called in the 911. We can go to the crime scene. Uh, we can check the autopsy, or the autopsy report at the courthouse, or we can look at the forensic science report. So another thing to note too, is that we start here at headquarters. We got our nice car here. That's a cool car. <laughs> and then uh, anytime you want to travel to a place. So for example, this says field work. So that means you have to go to the field work location and every time you travel, it takes one hour. So you lose an hour. There's two at field work, courthouse and lab. So what do you think? What should we do? I think that we should go to the crime scene. And if we go to the field work, 
we can do interrogation and crime scene and just travel to one location. Although we don't know how many hours each lead will take. But, but we would not lose one hour <clears throat> traveling. <laughs> Either one, interrogation or crime scene. You want to do the crime, crime scene first? Sure. 602. Okay, so card 602 takes two hours. Or well, plus the one because we traveled. Right? Oh, we have to move it. So... Wow. (laughs) And we lose one hour and then two more for this card. You pull up to the house at 602 Donview Street. The garden has been neglected and the house itself is small, rather atypical for the affluent neighborhood. You can see that one of the windows is heavily charred. This must be because of the fire Roland mentioned. In front of the house, the head of the forensic science department is wiping his shoes on the grass. He clearly stepped in something. He waves hello to you. Beep job. (laughs) He laughs, shaking your hand and pointing to what he stepped in. Another team will come by later today and take the rest of the evidence in for analysis. You have some time for the crime scene inspection, but please be careful. Okay. Sometimes they'll have a condition here which will determine whether you can flip the card over or not. Since this one is blank, we can go ahead and look at the back. You go inside and pass the spot where the body was lying. There's a bloody pool and an outline of a figure. The floor is half burnt near the fireplace. A chair has been overturned and a table has been moved. A half unpacked suitcase is lying on the table. Some of the clothes have been placed on a nearby sofa. You put on your gloves and go through the pile. Jeans, two sweaters, and some t-shirts. There is still a baggage tag on the suitcase. The girl came here on a bus from Michigan three days ago. You go from one room to another waiting for something to catch your eye. Nothing. Upstairs, on the dresser, there's a photo of a girl with who appears to be her grandmother. At first glance, you might think that it's a boy's room because of all the Cleveland Cavaliers posters hanging on the walls. Granny... Jadwiga. Okay, so is this the victim? I think so. (laughs) Further leads. Check the police files from the fire. Going to the police station. Look around the neighborhood and determine which neighbors to question. I like that one. Okay, before that, should we interview Smitty? And then if we have time, we can do more field work and ask around. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) It's already lunchtime. 601. So this will take two hours, but since we're in the same location don't have to lose an hour. The weather in Cleveland hasn't been particularly kind to us this year. The nasty cold February forecast keeps the whole city in shackles of darkness. You cover the distance between the parking lot and the cafe at a fast pace and go inside. You are welcomed by the pleasant warmth and smell of freshly ground coffee. You sit at a table near the window, order a black coffee, and go through your phone while waiting patiently for Smitty. A couple of minutes pass and the door opens, letting in the cold February air. A young man wearing a Batman sweater looks around with a somber face. A moment later, he moves towards you. He hesitantly slides the chair out, sits down, and mutters a faint morning. You get straight to the point. Why did you go to the house? He looks out the window and says nothing. Why did you go to the house? You persisted. What were you looking for? Did you kill her? No, it's not like that, he finally says. I'm not a murderer. Then what happened here? Wow. Oh, then what happened there? Uh, Very subtle. Yeah. (laughs) And this is at a coffee shop. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So this says to just read questioning at 601. So we have to go through the website. And since it just says to read it, I mean, we don't have to give any tokens or anything. But for this one, we have to use a questioning token if we want to question him about his contacts and the neighborhood. So for this one, we have to decide now if we want to do it. Otherwise, we can't go back to this. So let's go to the website. Let's go to questioning at 601. Okay, so here's the interrogation. And also another thing to note are these are stress these initials. Levels. Yeah, so LSL is low stress level, medium stress level, and there's an HSL for high stress level. So it just kind of tells you, you know, whether 
they're nervous about something or it could be some emotional response, you just kind of have to look at the context and see what's going on. But they said if it's medium or high, then you know that they're hiding something. Most likely, or they could be angry about the topic or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever reason. Okay, interrogation of John Smitty. You look at John expectantly. Okay, you can sometimes get some stuff in this place. Oops, probably kind of nervous. I went there to see who was around. Then I found a dead girl there. What exactly did you find? She was lying on the floor in a pool of blood, twisted in a strange way. Okay, he's telling the truth. There were overturned furniture around here. You could see there had been an altercation. I took off real fast. Later it dawned on me that someone might have seen me. Besides, my fingerprints are there. So I turned myself in to anticipate any questions as a witness and not as a murderer. How did you get inside? Normally I go through the back doors. They haven't been locked for years. Did you know the victim? John looks at his hands for a while. A trace of sadness passes across his face. We will check it anyway. Yes, I knew Susan. When she moved in, we went out for a while. She was interrogated when I got busted for possession, but she was clean. She seemed like a good girl, but she later broke up with me when she started becoming interested in Richards, the basketball player. I didn't keep in touch with her after that, and now she's dead. Could someone have been there before you? Well, you could meet various people there. As I said, sometimes you can get some beep there. <laughs> mm, so is there, dealing drugs? there just drug dealing there? He's nervous about something. You could do the further leads, check personal files. Case files for John's arrest. Courthouse. Okay, this one, yeah, we can look up. At Tom, Tom Richards. Richards. This is the basketball player. <laughs> Whoa, look at his cool shades. <laughs> Tom Barney Richards. Okay, 6'6". Six, six. Blue eyes, brown hair. Small scar on his forehead. Tattoo on the right forearm. Additional data. Former NBA player. Interrogated as a witness with regard to the fire at the house on 602 Donview Street. Case file. 61615. Okay. So he was a witness of the fire. Okay. Known connections. Melissa Richards, wife. Too. Files on the fire at the house. We have to go to the police station. Interrogation of Tom Richards. So let's just look up the wife. Oh. Okay. Oh, nice. Oh, well, that's easy. You can just do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, from Boston. Boston. Uh, tattoo on the lower back. Tattoo on the left arm. Interrogated as witness to regard to the fire on the house. Okay. We can interrogate her as well. That's field work. Files on the fire. Oh, everything keeps pointing back to this fire. Okay, what do we have here though? I think we should do 622 field work and question the neighbors. Since we're here at the field work, you don't want to ask the neighbors anything? You want to go back to the police station? It's already 2 o'clock. Oh uh, yeah, we'll have to do that tomorrow, I think. 622. Ooh, one hour. Okay, so we have to go back here. We're now at 3. The house at 602 Donview Street has a view looking upon several of the neighboring houses. You log into the system and gather information about the neighbors. Antara's system quickly gives you the basic plan of the neighborhood. 602 is the bottom left. This is the house, right? Mm -hmm. So it's 605, 607, 609. So before our day ends, let's not forget about this. Another action we can take every day or once a day is write a report. So we lose one hour and we gain an authority token. But because of Jack Coleman's ability, we would gain two authority tokens. And then with your ability, we can spend two to get this wild card token, which we can use as any other. So we have an hour left and I was <coughs> wondering whether you want to do that. Or do you want to try to do something else and risk going over time? I think in the normal game, uh, these tokens are probably very useful, but in this demo, it's probably so short that <laughs> it's better to get info, right? I, I say we, we go with one of these, but which one? I say... I'd say this one, right? Because at least they share the back. 
five or seven, right? Maybe let's just go at 607. All right, 607. So this is one hour. The house at 607 Donview Street is neat and tidy. Unfortunately, there is no one home when you arrive. You get the phone number from Robert Dox, the homeowner from Antares, and contact him over the phone. You get to chatting with him and learn that he and his wife work at City Hall. They leave for work around 7 a.m. and on their way, drive their son Patrick to school. They would not have heard the shots or seen anyone. The house has been unoccupied ruin ever since the fire, and unfortunately, no one has bought it yet, so it stands abandoned. Sometimes you can see some suspicious guys there. My son Patrick saw someone enter the house through the back door a couple of times. We reported this to the police, but no one was interested. We had the impression that someone had been around again in recent days, but we just told, but we just told Patrick to stay away from the fence between the houses. Oh, so actually... It's been unoccupied. Yeah. So she doesn't live there, but what was that photo doing there? (laughs) A couple of years back, on the tragic day of the fire, they were at the stadium. Their neighbor, Mrs. Richards, got them tickets to the game. They stated that, unfortunately, her husband did not play in that game because of an injury. The doxes were relieved that the fire brigade came quickly and stopped the danger. If the fire had spread, who knows what would have happened. Mrs. Richards... Hold on, Tom Richards, and the wife is Richards. This is the the guy that oh. Susan has been hanging around with, and he was a, uh, interrogated as a witness to the fire. So, Mister Richards, Tom Richards didn't play that day because of an injury. I'm assuming NBA game, right? Yeah, and the stadium. I'm guessing is mm-hmm. the basketball stadium. So, back to Mrs. Richards. All right, so that does it for day one. What if the Richards gave them a ticket so they wouldn't be home? I think so, too. My question, sorry, my question is, which house does the Richards live in? That is a good question. Hold on, let me go back to this. Okay, so John Smitty used to date the victim, uh, but she dumped him and became interested in Richards but Richards is married Mm -hmm. so it was an affair well it doesn't really say that just (laughs) that she was interested in him Uh, okay okay Um, I was just trying to find the connection again between Mm -hmm. Tom Richards can you go back to the introduction it says a fire that caused the death of a married couple and then the sudden disappearance of their daughter Oh, is Susan the daughter? I don't know. Can't jump to that conclusion. Uh, Okay, well, with that, I already moved it, but we're on day two, and we go back to headquarters. Are you going in reverse? (laughs) Steve! Yeah. (laughs) So now you want to look at the report on the fire? car effect i'll add it in <laughs> fine <laughs> one hour so that's one hour and then another one at this time of the year the entire main hall of the police station is covered with mud and snow dragged in from outside a quick visit to the station will get you the files on the 2015 fire at 602 donview street read file at 614 okay files 614. So, commanding officer for the firefighting operation, senior warrant officer Samuel Cropper. The case of the death of the house residence, Inspector James Luke Town. So, on January 16, 2015, a fire broke out on 602 Donview. The fire was reported at 11 p.m. by Rose Flowers, a neighbor living on the same street. Flowers alleged that she saw the fire through the windows and smoke coming from the house. The firefighters arrived at the scene four minutes after the call. The police and ambulance followed. The firefighters entered the house. Doors were unlocked. They saw flames dying in the fireplace and a stack of spare wood smoking in a metal basket nearby. The spare wood catching fire was most likely caused by a spark from the fireplace. The bodies of two persons, a woman and a man, were also found in the house. They were found lying naked on the carpet, covered only with a sheet. No other people were found in the house. The fire was not a serious one and was extinguished quickly. 
The firefighters inspected the structure of the house and deemed it secure. During the investigation, the chimney duct was found to be poorly ventilated, and the fire alarm in the chimney was found to be malfunctioning, not having warned of the rising concentration of carbon monoxide in the air. Fingerprints were lifted at the site. Most of them matched fingerprints of the residents. Some were unidentified. Ooh. No signs of forced entry or struggle were found in the house. The police ruled out foul play. Report from the autopsy. The autopsy indicated inhalation of toxic gases as a cause of death. The victims were already dead when the fire broke out. The inhalation of toxic gases was the result of a blocked chimney duct and faulty alarm system. Jenny Novak, female, aged 55, a slight body build, height 5 feet 5 inches, hair dark, dyed. No indications of the use of force were found on the body. The autopsy indicated carbon monoxide poisoning as the direct cause of death. No toxic substances were found in the victim's system, but there were traces of painkillers, alcohol, and food. Bob Novak, male, aged 61, thin body build, height 5 feet 10 inches, hair gray. No indications of the use of force were found on the body. The autopsy indicated carbon monoxide poisoning as a direct cause of death. No toxic substances were found in the victim's system, but there were traces of hypertension medication, sildenafil, alcohol and food Ooh. Ooh, we can search that so this little wi-fi thing tells you you could go look it up on google oh it's viagra, viagra. okay okay and then we can also enter the fingerprints yeah too. so let's do this you double click oh oh there we got it okay cool and then let's go back and add bob okay so <clears throat> we only have their fingerprints so now if we find anything in the house that matches them we know why note from the police report the novak family moved to the suburbs of cleveland in 2011 jenny novak was unemployed and taking care of the house bob novak worked in the insurance industry for 40 years susan novak susan novak oh so it is the daughter Mm -hmm. Susan Novak studied sociology at the local university. She worked at Bertha's Cafe nearby. She was not at home during the fire. Her whereabouts are unknown. Notes from questioning witnesses. Residents of the house at 611 Downview Street. 616. Oh, 616. Wait, 6. Okay. Uh, Tom Richards, athlete. Cleveland Cavaliers basketball player. He was not formally questioned, but only asked about the neighbors. He knew the Novaks. He claims he did not keep in touch with them, but only ran into them occasionally on the street. He testified that he visited the Novaks only once at the welcoming barbecue, but that he did not remember when it took place. He claimed that his wife would know. During the fire, he was at the Quicken Loans Arena for the NBA Finals where his team was playing, even though he was injured and would personally not be playing. Okay, that lines up. That lines up. However, he said that he only met the Novak one time. Unless that is when he gave them tickets. Oh, the wife got them tickets. Melissa Richards. She confirmed that her husband was not at home during the event and that she was watching the game on TV alone. As every year, it is kind of a holiday for them. A holiday to watch it to be separate i guess <laughs> annotation in the notes she did not seem to be thrilled about the finals she spoke about it with sarcasm a side note strange sentence i wanted to see my husband courtside very much but i did not see him once when asked why she did not accompany her husband at the game she said she found the sport boring residents of the house at 605 downview street so across from the house with the fire yeah this is the one across mm -hmm. and this is the one who reported the fire rose flowers pensioner she reported the fire she is not interested in sports and did not watch the nba finals perhaps that's why she was the one to notice the fire other residents from the street testified that they were watching the game or visiting friends to watch the game she noted being concerned about susan novak the daughter of the married couple found in the house she did not see anything suspicious on the day of the accident annotation in the notes she mentioned that she would have to pass this tragic news to her friends from the club when asked about what club she was talking about, she mentioned the Estate Book Club. Residents of the house of 609 Donview Street, so this is diagonally across from the house. Mm -hmm. Daryl Stope. 
He was with his friends at the local bar. He heard that the Richards also had problems with the fireplace. His wife had seen a maintenance company car in front of their home a couple of weeks earlier. He knew Bob Novak. The two sometimes went to the pub for a beer, but on that night, Bob wanted to stay at home. Who's Bob again? The, the husband who guy. died. Uh, Barbara Stoke. The wife confirmed her husband's words, although she used other expressions. She confirmed that those fireplaces had some factory flaws from what she had heard and that the whole estate replaced the sensors. So this fireplace issue seems to be a common occurrence. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we got some leads here. We can talk to Samuel Cropper or James Luke Town. So they again? he's the firefighting operation and the, the case on the deaths is James. Uh, so if we're more interested in the, this fire, then maybe he was investigating the fire. So we have those two leads. We also... Oh, and we, we would have to go to either field work or the police station. And we're already at the police station. Oh, that's true. That's a good point. So maybe we just have to... But that's the death. Mm, what I mean, what are they going to find? We already know why they died. <laughs> we already got a pretty good autopsy report. Right. Um, we're more interested in this fire fireplace, right? That one, and also, I still want to see the body of the... The uh, friends of Susan. So it's interrogating Mrs. Richards... We can do that. We can look at the other houses, but not okay. 616. <laughs> but 609, that's a lot of info. They notice the truck and all that stuff. If you don't want to do any of these, then we have the autopsy report, the forensic science report. They said she was shot, right? Mm -hmm. the victim was shot with a gun. Maybe forensics? The lab. Okay, so field work, police station, or the lab. <laughs> Nothing overlaps. I'm always interested in forensics. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So we have to go to the lab. Vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> and then that'll take us an hour. And we take 6.04. Two hours. Oh, man. Uh, hey, it's only one o'clock. Skipping lunch. The first batch of items secured at the crime scene has already reached the laboratory. The second forensic science team's visit and any additional requests of the investigators will increase the collection of items to be examined. But right now, the most obvious and important items are being thoroughly analyzed. You go to the sixth floor past the workspaces of the forensic scientists and reach the laboratory's office. Six computer stations welcome you with the blue glow of their screens. You walk up to the first one and select the forensic science report from the menu. You enter the case number, your access code, and soon you have access to the materials. You press the files, but also send them digitally to the Antares server so that every member of the team working on the case has access to them. When leaving with your file, you pass two investigators from another Antares team having a heated discussion about the case of a stolen watch. You don't think they even noticed you. You start reading through the report in the elevator. It's probably like a different case, right? So now read file 604. Okay. Forensic science report. Traces collected at the crime scene include fingerprints, hair, and elements of tracked soil and mud. Footprints left in the garden have been preserved in plaster casts. Although one of that, the lead investigator... Remember he oh had, yeah, he stepped in. And he like totally, I was thinking, you're ruining the crime scene. <laughs> okay, fingerprints were lifted off the suitcase, front door, kitchen services, and a number of other places. Fresh prints, well preserved. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Okay, so Susan. Fingerprints two, lifted off the back door. All right. Who is it? John Smitty. Okay. The back door. He said he only went through the front. But he, oh, he admitted going in yeah. and out of that location. That's right. K three lifted off the overturned chair. It's incomplete. Mm -hmm. Noted by these X's. So we don't know who it is. Uh, soil samples. At the threshold of the front door and in the room where the victim was found. Oh, and there's a bullet casing found under the couch. Okay, well, let's go ahead and 
So that means someone walked through the soil. No match found in the database. Okay, let's go back. Oh, did I do this one? No. Oh, okay, the bullet. No match. Team did not find any signs of forced entry. No traces were found of any tampering with the front door or the back door. Items secured at the crime scene. Keys with the Cleveland Cavaliers 2015 key ring. RTA Red Line train ticket. Validated upon arrival on February 11th, 9 a.m. Tower City Rapid Station Arena walkway. Torn off pendant and hair clip. Can you search the RT red line? Yeah, the red line is just from the airport to downtown. And that's it. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's good. Got a lot of uh, evidence. All right. So that'll do it for this video. Look out for the next one coming soon. Don't forget to give us a like, subscribe to our channel, and we hope to see you again in the gamery.